الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد All praise is due to Allah the one who deserves all praise and we ask Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace and send his blessings and his salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and upon his companions and his wives and all those who follow them on their path of righteousness until the day of recompense. All you who have believed, be mindful of Allah and fear him the way he deserves to be feared. And do not die except in the state of Islam. Brothers in faith, I'm going to present to you a scenario. And the scenario is one where a father is with his two children in a supermarket. And the two children are in a separate aisle than the one that the father's in. Therefore, he has no access to see them. The younger one punches the older one quite hard and so the older one retaliates and punches him back in a softer manner knowing that he is older and stronger the little kid the younger one runs to you crying and says my brother punched me now the average father, depending on what method of disciplining and dealing with the children he follows, the average father will be raged at the sight of his younger child in the state of tears. And he may rush to the older one and scold him immediately. And if he's the type that dis disciplines his children physically, not in a sense for those who think that this is okay. Not that he will afflict harm upon him. But if he sees that physical disciplining is something that is beneficial and useful, he might also immediately smack his son without any further discussion. And you can imagine the state of that young man, the older brother, who got hit first, retaliated, and then he's now the guilty party 100%. But this is not news really. This is not news because this is something that happens every single day, all over the world, but it takes a different form and a different context. However, if we were to look percentage wise, maybe 90% will be guilty like that father and only 10% would be among those whom Allah Azza wa Jal and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about those who establish justice. Dawood Alayhi Salam was sitting in his mihrab, a place of worship as in Surah Sad, Ayah 21 to 26. The people were trying to reach him because he was a judge among the people. But because he had his door closed and they needed an immediate fatwa, when they couldn't access him because he was busy in ibadah, they jumped the wall. They entered upon him in a manner that is unusual and unacceptable. So when he saw them, he got scared. Somebody breaks into your house. They don't usually come in to say, I have a question for you. They come in to rob you. 
He was afraid of them. They said, don't be afraid. We are two contending people. Some say it was a group of people. Some say it was two brothers. The end of the ayat suggests that it was only two people. We are two people. And we've come to you for judgment. So judge between us in justice. And don't lean towards one or the other. And then they spoke. He said, This brother of mine has 99 female sheep. In English, it's called a U, E W E. Odd word. We stick to female sheep for simplicity. I have only one female sheep. This brother, whether it is a blood brother or a religious brother, brother in faith, has 99 female sheep. I have only one. And then he asked me for it. He asked me for it and he debated with me and argued with me and he actually beat me in the arguing. He was good improving his point and why it would be in his interest to give his only female sheep to the brother who was already 99. Dawood alayhi salam said, لَقَدْ ظَلَمَكَ بِسُؤَالِ نَعْجَتَكَ إِلَى نِعَاجِهِ He has wronged you by asking you to give your female sheep to his. And verily many among those who are partners, many partners, they wind up wronging each other. Any two people in a business partnership might wind up wronging each other. Except those who believe and do righteous deeds, but they are a few. And then Allah said, And then Dawood, he had certainty that we have tried him. That he was tested. So then he returned to his Lord and he sought forgiveness. And then he fell in prostration and he returned to Allah. If you were to read the tafsir of the ulama in regards to this story, and why did Dawood feel that he was tested? And why did he feel guilty? And why did he? Repent to Allah and return in repentance is because of the following three things. Number one, that he had his door closed, preventing people from access to him even though need, they needed him. Number two, he did not hear the other person's side of the story. One spoke, the other didn't get to speak at all. And then he passed the judgment that he had wronged you by asking you. And those are the three things that you will find the vast majority of Muslims are guilty of today, especially in this world of social media. It is an obligation on the believer Whenever any type of news reach that person, whenever any type of news reaches that person, that they have to verify the news. Allah says, Oh, you have believed if an evil person, if a liar comes to you with news, فَتَبَيَّنُوا Verify it. Lest you wind up wronging people unjustly and then you will become over what you have done regretful. The story of Dawood is a classic example of what we call one-sided story. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said to Ali, if two people come to you contending, then do not judge until you've heard both. And some of the scholars go the extra mile and say, you're not actually allowed to hear one person and then sit with the other person and hear his side of the story. You should bring them together at the same time. Why? Because the first person, when he tells you his narrative, it's going to include all the points that they want to highlight and emit all the things that they want to hide. And no matter how intelligent you are, you may be swayed by the conversation. So when you hear the other side, you will still be in favor of the first. That's why the scholars say for the Qadi, it is a requirement to bring 
both people. And then each one gets to speak his side of the story. And then you may judge in whichever person deserves the judgment, whether he's guilty or innocent. So the question which we ask ourselves should be, I'm a layman. Information comes to me about any person from among the Muslims. What are the expectations that I should have and what are the levels of involvement that are upon me? And this is general speech for everybody. Because of the lack of implementation of these etiquettes, we have disasters and people carrying so many sins on their back that they will carry with them until Yawm Al Qiyamah way greater, maybe way greater than the person that they are actually talking ill about. And it is an amazing twist of events. The first thing is deliberation. The Prophet ﷺ said, deliberation is from Allah and haste is from the shaitan. As soon as any information comes to you about anything within work, within the family, your aunt comes over to your house and she starts talking about your uncle and he did this and he did that and he did this and he did that and the people automatically build a case for her and then they boycott the uncle or they make a case against him and no one bothers to raise the phone and say, come over, let's talk about this. And how often, how often is it when you hear his side of the story, you turn around and say, really? Really? He was the guilty one and you were the one making a claim? Subhanallah! Subhanallah, what a twist! How often have you experienced this in your life? When you pass the judgment way too early. So deliberation, take it easy, man. Don't be hasty to talk about it. Secondly, verification. Verification. Whenever someone makes a claim, if there wasn't a principle in Islam that says, al to alamani da'a, the clear proof is upon the claimant, then anyone would claim anything. I will say, this brother stole my money outside. And he tried to run over my son while we were crossing the street. And he knocked on my door last night at 2 in the morning, telling me he's going to you know, bring people to beat me up. If I made this claim right now, is everybody going to say this is the khatib? He's not going to come up with the story and we go and demonize his brother and get him arrested? That would be haram upon all of you. It would be haram upon all of you. Such information is useless. Anybody can claim anything at any point in time and who is to say what and how? There are means of verification that must be established within Islam. If they were to be established, let's say a proof was presented, Alhamdulillah. Now that you have a case, what is the context of this case? What is the context of the situation? What is the context of the claim? And so either you are in a position that this is related to you, it is relevant to you, so you have to meticulously analyze and go into it because you're a judge of some sort. Barakallah feek, may Allah bless your efforts. Or it's something that doesn't really concern you. And this is why you are advised by Al Hassan al Basri that a believer withholds judgment until the truth has been proven. You don't pass a judgment until everything has become clear to you. Until you have a full picture with full details that has no room for any ifs and what ifs and hypothetical scenarios and situations. This is the obligation upon the believer. One news, the third thing, and among the means of verification is contacting the person in, 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 in this context. The person that is being accused. Reach out to this person respectfully and deliver the information accordingly. And wait till you hear the other side. Do not be hasty in judging, making it seem like it's a light matter. 
And in the second part of the khutbah, I will remind myself and you about a subject matter that the people took lightly, but it wind up being of tremendous gravity in the ummah until today. So these are the obligations upon us whenever we are in this kind of predicament. These are the guidelines that Allah Azza wa Jal established for the ummah. And we praise Allah for the deed of Islam. And we praise Allah for the mercy of Allah. And we praise Allah for how particular the laws are and how just they are. And how Allah Azza wa Jal defends those who believe. It is a mercy from Allah. It is a mercy from Allah, the, the framework of Islam and its teachings and its rulings and its regulations and its penal codes is mercy from Allah. If you were to take matters outside the context of dealing with them Islamically, any subject matter can become a disaster. But Allah is merciful to us. And we ask Allah to make us among those who listen to the reminder and follow the best of it. الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد عائشة أم المؤمنين رضي الله عنها وأرضاها If you were to read her story of the ifk or the slander and the lie that they came up against her I think very few believers will be able to withhold their tears. And I advise you to read the story and the context of the ayat that were revealed about Aisha radiallahu anha in Surah An-Nur. I advise you to do so. You owe it to yourself. To take certain lessons from the story. Aisha radiallahu anha was among the purest of women and among the finest women that Allah Azza wa Jal created in terms of religious commitment and fear of Allah and knowledge. She was among the best of women ever. And sure enough, in the incident where the caravan was moving from one destination to another, no need to mention the locations and the geographic matters because this is something you can read on your own. She had her necklace fall. And the caravan moved while she was still fetching for her necklace. And so eventually when she found it and she wanted to catch up with the caravan, they were already gone. And so with little hope, she lied down in her place where, she, where the caravan was once there. Because when they carried it, they couldn't feel that she wasn't in there. They thought she was in there. And she thought they would find out that she's missing at some point and come back to get her. And she fell asleep. Then one of the Sahabis who was behind, behind the caravan to begin with, as he was walking on, his, on the same path, he saw something with a black cloth lying down in the desert. And when he came close, he recognized that this was Aisha because he had seen her before the ayat of hijab were revealed. And she was sleeping. So he only said one word, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. When she heard him, she woke up, no conversation happened whatsoever. He brought down the camel, she got on the camel, and he caught up with the caravan. And Aisha went home like nothing happened. The Munafiqeen were always trying to capitalize on any event to tarnish the image of the Prophet ﷺ. So they accused her of remaining behind and that she had an affair with this Sahabi. And she went through the most difficult times of her life where she, doesn't, she didn't do anything, she's innocent, and words were going around about her. She was distressed. The Prophet ﷺ was distressed. He sought advice from different Sahabis as to his position. He eventually gave a khutbah in her defense, but still until then, Nothing was known. Then he said, Oh Aisha, if you are innocent, then Allah shall make you innocent clear. 
And if you have sinned, then verily seek forgiveness of Allah and seek repentance because Allah accepts the repentance of the one who repents. And this is the Prophet ﷺ speaking to his wife. And it wasn't long before Allah revealed the ayat in Surah An-Nur, which I recommend that you read. But I'm going to highlight the ayat that are most relevant. Where Allah says, لَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ ظَنَّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بِأَنفُسِهِمْ خَيْرًا وَقَالُوا هَذَا إِفْكُمْ مُبِينَ Had you only when you heard this information being spread, assume good about fellow believers, males or females, and said, verily, this is a great slander. This is the fundamental position of the believer until the guilty person is proven guilty, which he may turn out to be guilty in some way. But until then, the fundamental reaction is you seek refuge with Allah and then you assume good about the believers. Then Allah says, إِذْ تَلَقَّوْنَهُ بِأَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَتَقُولُونَ بِأَفْوَاهِكُمْ مَا لَيْسَ لَكُمْ بِهِ, ما ليس لكم به علم وَتَحْسَبُونَهُ هَيِّنًا وَهُوَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَظِيمٌ As you receive the news with your tongues and you say with your mouths that which you have no knowledge of and you perceive it to be a light matter but it is with Allah of great significance and importance. Allah Azza wa Jal teaches us some of the etiquettes that have to do with these type of situations. The etiquettes that have to do with these types of situations. That you assume good about your fellow Muslim. First and foremost. And secondly, you don't get involved in the act of circulating this type of information. Because it falls under exposing and, and belittling and doing whatever harm to the Muslims that it does. Secondly, and the most important thing is why would you want to carry the sin of slander when you have nothing to do with the subject matter? Why would you want to say something that that person you said it about will grab you by your neck on Yawm Al-Qiyamah before Allah and say, Oh Allah, this person doesn't know me. This person didn't speak to me. This person didn't hear my side of the story. And he said this about me. Oh Allah, I want my right from him now. And Allah shall give that person his right. The sad news for all of us is that this type of oppression cannot be forgiven. The dhulm which we do between us and Allah, no matter how great it is, Allah will forgive. A man killed 99, 99 people, 99. And he wanted to repent to Allah. He asked a person of knowledge about repentance. He told him, you killed 99? 99 people just, just for, for the sake of it? What repentance? What are you talking about? When he made him despair, believe it or not, the man killed him as well. I mean, if there's no hope for me with Allah, then another one, a hundred over the 99 makes no difference. Subhanallah. But the man still felt guilty. He wanted to repent. He continued to ask until he found an actual scholar. Who told him, وَمَنْ يَحُولُ بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَ التَّوْبَةِ Who in the world has the right to go between you and Allah when it comes to repentance? Repent to Allah, just leave this city in which you're living and go to this other city where there are righteous people. The environment will help you. And sure enough, you know the hadith, on his way, he died. And the angels of mercy came to take his soul to Jannah. And the angels of punishment came to take a soul to Jahannam. This is a person who killed a hundred souls. We have no evidence that he prayed or fasted or did anything. And then Allah Azza wa Jal commanded that they measure the distance between the city he was in and the city he's going to. And when it was even, Allah made the earth shift so that it goes closer to the city he was going to. So the angels of Rahmah, of mercy took him and he was forgiven. Who is to come and say anything about these matters? So the sin between us and Allah, it's between us and Allah. But ya akhi, the sin that involves others, where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? This would be under the other hadith of the Muflis. 
the bankrupt one. A man will come on Yawm Al-Qiyamah with Salah and Zakah and Siyam, all types of good deeds. But he would come having oppressed this person, slandered this person, stole the money of that person. So now all of his good deeds will be taken away from him and given to those whom he wronged and oppressed until he depletes of good deeds. It doesn't end. He has zero good deeds now. Now phase two, now their bad deeds will be removed from them, the oppressed ones, and will be placed on him until he is thrown into the hellfire. وَالْعِيَاذُ بِاللَّهِ we seek refuge with Allah. And any one of us who likes to get involved in the subject matter is potentially putting himself in the forefront of these types of individuals. Ya akhi, be quiet. For your own good, be quiet. Withhold your tongue. Mu'ad ibn Jabal was advised by the Prophet The most important thing is your tongue. He said, are we held accountable for what we say? He said, ka ummuka ya Mu'adh. What else will throw the people on their faces in the hellfire except the consequences of their tongues? And don't think that if you type something, it's different than saying something. It's all saying something. It is not the verbal expression. It is the expression of the opinion. I advise myself and you to relax, man. Mind your business, ya akhi. Mind your business and don't be that judge that the Prophet ﷺ spoke about. The Prophet ﷺ said there are three types of judges. One who knows the truth and judges accordingly, he is in Jannah. One who knows the truth and judges wrongfully, he is in the hellfire. And one who is ignorant and judges, he is in the hellfire. And anyone who hears one side of a story and doesn't hear the other, by default, is ignorant and made a judgment and according to hadith he is in the hellfire i say we seek refuge with allah for all the believers to enter from the hellfire think before you speak have some wisdom have some serenity understand learn educate and the least you could do if all this is too confusing من حسن إسلام المرئي تركه ما لا يعني. From the good Islam of a person is leaving alone that which doesn't concern him. Leave those matters alone. Wallahi, I'm giving you this advice for your own good. Wallahi, sincerely for my own good and for your own good. And we live and we learn from these things. Sometimes it's best that we mind our own business. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to help us follow His teachings and the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In a manner which is pleasing to him. Allahumma ya muqallib al qulub, thabbit qulubana ala deenik. Allahumma ya musarrif al qulub, isrif qulubana ala ta'atik. Rabbana la tuzik qulubana ba'da idh hadaytana. Wahablana miladunka rahmatan inna ka anta al wahab. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. Wa fil akhirati hasana. Wa kina adhaban nar. Wa sallillahumma wa sallim ala nabi al mukhtar.